Good evening. Um, we have pondered this talk for quite a while. Um, actually, Rob tried to, to have this talk on what the heck, but it somehow didn't happen. We lost the war as the title because we feel that somehow we need to mention the fact that we actually lost the war. We lost the war for privacy. We lost the war for free internet, maybe. We lost the war against the surveillance industry, at least for now. So we won a few battles. We prevented the clipper chip quite a while ago. We managed to keep Germany at least an island of privacy in Europe. Um, but that's about it. And we think it's about time that we talk about this, that we think about why we have lost, what can be done, what is the situation now, and what follows from that, based on that we have some kind of foresight where the, the travel goes, where we'll end up, and what the technology is that will be used uh, to keep an eye on us. So essentially, this talk has two phases. One is we look at the situation, where we will be in two years, where we are right now, what can we, what can be seen in terms of tendency uh, of police state, of surveillance state, um, what technology will be upon us within a short time frame, and then try to develop ideas what can be done about that. So how we can stay relevant, how we can stay in a position to influence society to the better, and how to keep somehow a position where we are not completely helpless. So claiming that this is not the case and everything will be fine again is obviously not, not possible anymore. Okay, there are some risks and, and potential benefits of this talk. As Frank said, uh, first we'll look at the situation now and we're going to try to convince at least some portion of you that this is not, what we're seeing right now is not the normal swing of things. It's not, well, you know, you win some, you lose some, that there are really some fundamental things changing, about to change, and have changed in the world around us. Um, and then the second part is trying to think, as, as already mentioned, trying to think about what's going to happen next. Now, the main risk is that we'll do really well on the first part, convincing you all that doom is upon us, and then we'll fail miserably on the second part of figuring out what to do about it, so you'll all be very demotivated, won't feel like doing anything about it, and everything will be much worse than when we started. Um, some of this material can be quite depressing, and I mean that quite literally. I was very, very, very depressed for the past two years as this all started happening in Holland. I'll come back to why Holland has been specifically depressing over the past few years later. Um, let me see here. Uh, we're going to be doing this relatively, relatively quickly. We're going to have a lot to talk about, and we want some audience participation. We'd like to have 15 or 20 minutes left at the end, so we can try to get ideas, try to, to hear what people think are positive models for changing what's going on. But we'll get to that much later. Okay. Okay. Um, the situation now. Basically, we are inside the future that we always had in these dark sci-fi novels that we never wanted, that we speculated sometimes about when the winter was especially dark and uh, we were already in a bit depressed mood. And then we thought about how it would be the police state, the state that knows everything about us, um, the corporations that are basically part of the state entity. And we are there now. It's not a future anymore. It's not like a sci-fi movie or something like that. We are there now. And we need to live with that and think about what follows from that and what can be done. The logic behind everything is the politicians and the people who are really in power today have a view of the world that is entirely pessimistic. They see the crises that are on the horizon. They see that we have a climate change coming up. It's undeniable, meanwhile, which will mean that millions of people need to relocate, that vast areas of land will be not usable anymore, that huge amounts of real estate will not be insurable anymore because it will be below sea level. So we see that the, the change, changes of globalization have led to something that can no longer be sustained in the Western society in terms of labor for all. That was yesterday. So 
we are just in the phase where the politicians don't really want to acknowledge that there is simply is not enough labor anymore for everybody, but this is already the case. And so they need to prepare for that. They need to prepare in some sort of, I don't know what, what their mindset is about that, um, for a state where two thirds of the population will have no meaningful labor, but something that maybe earns their rent, but only maybe. So they see that immigration pressure is there, that a lot of people want to come to the West because it's even as worse as it has become, is even much better than the rest of the world. And so as cl uh, climate catastrophe strikes in Africa, we will have huge immigration pressure onto Europe. So also what we see is the energy crisis, peak oil, is there, so we can talk about if it's maybe five years or 10 years, but the end of fossil energy is there, which means that the society will need to develop alternatives very fast. And if that doesn't happen, then this, the disruptions will be severe. So uh, we also see that there are disruptive technologies on the horizon. So if you think of nanotechnology, we will have a talk about here, or if you think about uh, what follows on from the development of DNA technology, um, this can be, hugely disruptive for society. So what we see today under the banner of fight against terrorism is nothing but preparation for an even darker future in the minds of the people who govern us. So this future does not need to be as dark, but that's what they prepare for and that's what they in part at least aiming for. So in the end we will have a never ending state of emergency. There will always be some terror on demand that keeps up the fear. There will always be the next big scare that justifies the next law to further reduce our freedoms. There will always be some kind of technology that they don't really understand and that they would want to limit or keep under their control. And so today's tool for shaping a society is this terror on demand. The next tool that will come from them is data mining meaning that optimization of society in ways that we cannot imagine today, that maybe in novels like Gattaca have been pictured, this will ha really happen. This is what is our future now. So our future is a nicely colored, friendly, fully automated police state. It will be not really intrusive. If you have nothing to hide, then you should not be bothered, but it will be there. And it will end development society uh, it's a development of society as we know it today, if we don't find a way to, to go up against that. So the, the scope of technology as we, as we have it today in terms of surveillance, in terms of data mining, in terms of profiling, is virtually unlimited. If it does not work today because the data, l amount of data is too vast, it will certainly work in 10 years. If you look at the development of technology if, and say, okay, there is no way to store all email traffic because it's much too much data, that might be the case today. In 10 years, it will be available for sure as commercial technology. So um, pointing to this technology does not work or that technology does not work does not really help us because we can already see that it will work in the near future. And even if some particular technology like biometry fails entirely because for principal reasons, there are enough other alternatives for identification that they will use. If biometry fails, they will simply go for directly for DNA ident identification, which will be the next big wealth there. And this all is possible because democracy is essentially deprecated. If you look at the European Union, we are not really governed in certain areas of policy anymore by our parliaments. We are governed by directives that are dealed out in back rooms by people who are not even elected. This is the case today. So we are not governed by anything that resembles democracy at all. So it looks like democracy, people can debate, which is nice, that's why we're here sitting here, and we re retain certain freedoms, but the real decisions are not made anymore in a dem democratic way. And where it all ends is that the state is able to prosecute people he doesn't like selectively. So there will be no more thing called justice because if everything that you do is known at some point in some database and available for automatic policing, which is the end goal, then somebody or some algorithm can choose to prosecute you or not. And Rob can tell from Netherlands that it's already starting. 
Yeah. Um, I'm not sure many of you have been following the news in Holland, uh, at least not maybe in the same level of detail. You've seen the big events that have been happening. People have been mostly very surprised at what's been going on in Holland. Um, I'll go a little bit into it. There's a longer story. Uh, basically, through the 80s and 90s, we've had a couple of hidden crises. Holland was doing economically very well. We've had natural gas. Um, but there's been a hidden crisis in education. There's been a hidden crisis um, in immigration. There's been a hidden crisis. There's been a lot of, of, of events going on in Holland. And we've had, uh, through the 90s, we've had something very comparable to what's been happening here in Germany politically very recently. We've had a very broad coalition in politics. And because the coalition was very broad and because it was meant to exclude the Christian Democrats, it was formed around them, everything had to be agreed upon in back rooms. And because it had to be agreed upon beforehand, the whole political process in Holland over the late 90s basically died. This made, made room for a political movement that was sort of right-wing opportunistic, that came to power with Pim Fortuyn, even though he was personally shot at the time his party came to power in 2002, which basically spiraled Dutch politics into a wave of craziness that is still going on right now. Um, as it is, and as it probably always has been, the Dutch are the most scared nation in Europe. Uh, this is possibly contrary to our reputation, but the Dutch score highest on any fear, except for the fears that are really irrelevant in Holland, such as earthquakes, uh, of any population in the world based on standardized questions. Um, what this leads to is a population that is screaming for more control as, as this whole fear of terror, as, as many of you may know, the Dutch are part of the coalition of the coerced, and as such, we're in Iraq, together with our American friends. Uh, so everybody's completely uh, scared of terrorism, and the population is basically screaming for more control. Cameras are going up in streets, uh, police cameras. Uh, there's one particular street that I'm uh, a little bit involved in, and they have a camera every 100 meters. And then you look at, at the, the citizens meeting for that part of town, and people are upset that their street is not getting one. There's like huge uproar over these cameras because they want cameras in their streets as well. Um, what's going on right now? Uh, many of you have followed that uh, the chiefs of police in England want a system for every car, all car movements, every car passage to be registered, license plates to be read automatically in one big database to be created and retained of all vehicle movements. Uh, the Dutch have gone further than that. The Dutch chiefs of police have released a strategy document about three or four months ago, and that strategy document said the police needs to look at, store, and analyze, data mine, uh, all the data from all the infrastructural points where lots of people, money, uh, goods, information pass by. In other words, we need to be everywhere where there's lots of movement, and we need to store all of that in databases and start data mining it. Um, Another interesting thing that's going on in Holland is a policy which is in Dutch is called tegenhouden.